Thank you so much for saving your seat for the Second Opinion series, The Thyroid Sessions. I'm your host, Sean Croxton of Underground Wellness, hanging out with gluten expert, as well as the host of the Gluten Summit and teaching faculty for the Institute of Functional Medicine, Dr. Tom O'Brien. Dr. Tom, welcome hey, to the Sean, sessions. Thank you, thank you. Hey man, how have things been since the Gluten Summit? Very well, very well. Yeah. We're still getting lots of emails thanking us and from practitioners and uh, attendees who yeah. are saying, I had no idea this has changed my life. Thank you so much. That was a huge event, man. You really got the word about gluten just out to the masses, changed a lot of people's lives. And then right now, we're going to help change their lives when it comes to thyroid health. So lead off by telling us why thyroid health is so important. This will be important through the entire thyroid summit to understand this concept I'm about to give you. Hormones get into our cells by going through receptor sites. Receptor sites are like a catcher's mitt. The pitcher throws the ball to the catcher. You've got receptor sites on the outside of your cells to catch hormones going by in the bloodstream. Estrogen hormone goes into an estrogen receptor site. It will not go into a thyroid receptor site. Progesterone goes into a progesterone receptor site. It will not go into an insulin receptor site. Thyroid hormone goes into a thyroid receptor site. It will not go into other receptor sites. Mm -hmm. So receptor sites are the catcher's mitts for thyroid hormone to come into. There are only two substances for which there are receptor sites in every cell of your body, every cell, which means those substances have some influence on every cell of your body. The first one is vitamin D, which is why we see so many studies about vitamin D helping with so many different things for children and adults from autoimmunity to learning deficits. Across the gamut, vitamin D is being shown to be helpful for so many different conditions. The other receptor site on every cell of your body is thyroid hormone. There is no receptor site for estrogen on every cell of your body. The only hormone is thyroid hormone. Why? Because thyroid is the thermostat that controls the temperature inside every cell. We call that our metabolism. Yeah. And just like in the wintertime, you turn the thermostat down at night to keep the save fuel because everybody's asleep and it automatically turns up in the morning so the house is warm when people wake up. Thyroid hormone controls the temperature the, the level of function of every cell of your body. So what might the symptoms be if thyroid hormone is not, if thyroid and thyroid hormone are not functioning correctly? Anything, mm -hmm. any symptom in your body may be caused by a thyroid dysfunction. Any symptom, any system, any organ, because thyroid metabolism controls the temperature or the amount of fire, the amount of activity of every cell of your body. What are some of the most common symptoms that you see? With thyroid dysfunction? Yes. The most commonly known are when things are sluggish. If your metabolism is turned down, if the house is cold, if your cells aren't working at the speed they're supposed to, things are sluggish or they will show up as being sluggish. So, the easiest way to look for it are there some common signs and symptoms like temperature. People are cold, they're chilled, cold hands and feet. And you, people say, no, I don't have cold hands and feet. Oh, but do you wear socks to bed? Mm -hmm. And so many women especially say, well, yeah, yeah, because your feet are cold, you got a cold hands and feet. You know, they right. don't tie it together. Or does your husband say that your feet are cold at night? Um, uh, so temperature is a very common one. A lack of vital energy, a lack of what I call the juice of life. So people get through the day, they're feeling pretty good. How you doing? I, I feel pretty good. That's not acceptable, but that often can be sluggish thyroid function that causes that. Um, a lack of activity to brain function. So you know, if you kind of feel like you're just not firing on all eight cylinders, uh, that the brain's not working uh, sharp. Uh, that may be thyroid dysfunction. Um, you can't lose that last five pounds, even if you don't eat for a day or two. That uh, an inability to lose weight. Why? Because your metabolism is slower. The temperature, the thermostat's turned down, so you just won't burn the calories, even when you're really being calorie conscious. You and I have been out before, and you've been able to identify people with thyroid problems by looking at their faces and looking at their hair and their eyebrows and whatnot. Talk about that. There are some common suggestive indicators. They're not diagnostic, but they're suggestive, the distal third of the eyebrows being thinned out, uh, brittle hair, dry skin, so you see people with little cracks in their skin, uh, very common signs that you might see, but really the, um, 
uh, distal third of the eyebrows is a very common one you can see easily. And you look across the room, you say, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. It's everywhere. You, just, you see it again and again and again. That's why thyroid is so critical to talk about and to learn and to check it out if your thyroid's functioning normally or not. Because every cell of your body or any cell of your body may be impacted. You mentioned brain function as well. Would that be mood, depression? Absolutely, absolutely. Very, very common. People with sluggish thyroids will be on antidepressants because they just don't have that spark of life and they feel down and depressed. Mm -hmm. And when people are placed on, one approach is to place people on thyroid medication. It's not, I wouldn't recommend it as the first step, but it is necessary at times. But when they get on thyroid medication or if they do a thyroid um, um, healing profile, do the right things to get your thyroid working better, they notice that they have a brighter outlook on life and they don't require as much medication or for many people they don't require the antidepressant medication anymore. I want to caveat you always check with your doctor and confirm before you stop prescription medications. But many people find they just don't need them. Mm -hmm. What are some of those things that impact the thyroid in a negative way? Ah, well, here's a, here's a slam dunk pearl for your summit that's not known very often, is that the receptor sites um, only take thyroid hormone, but there are chemicals in our environment that will bind up in thyroid receptor sites. The most common one is chlorine. Mm -hmm. So uh, a common question we'll ask is, um, if you're in an elevator in a hotel, and the elevator door is open, can you tell the swimming pool's on that floor right away? And some people say, oh yeah, right away. Well, you may have a sensitivity to chlorine and that's suggestive that they may have too much chlorine, they can't metabolize it, and it's binding up on the receptor sites for thyroid. Hmm. So those are people, and we'll talk about NTI in a little while, but they do a thyroid blood test and it's normal, but they have the symptoms. And it's because the, the hormones in the bloodstream, it's on the highway, but it's not getting into the cell to function. So it's blocking the shot. Blocking the shot, exactly. Uh, like a slam dunk, or not a slam dunk, but a, uh, just a block right on the, the guy thinks he's going down for the big one, right? And he just, uh -huh. can't, he can't so get it done. puts it on the glass, <laughs> right, 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 I got you, I got you. All right, and so chlorine. So, so for those people, you, you need a chlorine shower filter. Because mm -hmm. the most common exposure to chlorine is in the shower. We inhale the steam, and there's chlorine in the steam, and it goes right through our lungs. Mm -hmm. So if you have that, possible sensitivity, it's worth the investment in a chlorine shower filter. And what you notice also is your skin is uh, nicer after a while, your hair is nicer, just from not being exposed to so much chlorine. So chlorine is number one, what else you have for us? Bromide, fluoride, are, there are three in that family of chemicals that bind on the receptor sites. Uh, uh, chlorine is primary and then uh, uh, fluoride and that's in the toothpaste and things. Mm -hmm. Some people would do better without fluoride, and there's a big argument about fluoride, it's understandable, but some people may do better. Mm -hmm. And then bromine, which is in some of the baked goods that people eat. Okay. So that's in the chemicals. The next thing that inhibits thyroid function is foods, and that if we have a sensitivity to foods, uh, well, I'll get to the sensitivity in a minute. There are foods that are call, called goitrogenic, meaning that they may inhibit thyroid function. And um, those include the cruciferous family of vegetables, uh, broccoli, cabbage, uh, uh, cauliflower. okra, cauliflower. Is that just the raw form of the cruciferous vegetables or cooked as well? I don't know. Um, I, I haven't seen a study that differentiates the two. Mm -hmm. And it's not many people that have that. Those foods are really good for you for many, many reasons. But if you notice that you're still getting the thyroid symptoms and you're applying some protocols that you learn in this summit, and you aren't quite getting it yet, you might eliminate the cruciferous vegetables for a period of time, maybe a couple of weeks to see. All of a sudden, oh, my feet aren't cold anymore, or I'm feeling warmer, or any of the other symptoms. And, and, and that's because of the goitrogens, correct? Correct. What about soy and millet as well? Soy is one of those that would, it's a really good question, it falls in the category of impacting on thyroid, possibly impacting on thyroid function in a negative way. Gotcha. So we've got the goitrogenic foods, but what about other foods? Really good question, and uh, comes into my world of expertise, and that is gluten sensitivity with or without celiac disease. And we know- well, what, what, what does that, that mean real quick, with or without celiac? Because a lot of people think gluten is only a problem if you are celiac. Really good question. Uh, 
our, our knowledge about gluten being a problem for people and some people came up through the ranks of studying celiac disease. That was considered at one time the only manifestation of a gluten sensitivity. We now know the science is very clear and there are many papers that say, no, that's not true. That's one manifestation. It's not even that common compared to the others. And so very important is celiac disease. About 1% of the population may suffer from celiac disease, whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. But um, the studies currently are saying anywhere from 6 to 20% of the population are, may be suffering from non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And uh, that's much more important for the numbers of people that may be affected. Mm -hmm. So when I say with or without celiac disease, it's for those people who still haven't been exposed to more current literature that says celiac is one manifestation and not the only manifestation. Really important to differentiate because many doctors still think that if you have a gluten sensitivity, it's going to manifest in your gut as celiac disease. And th that's not true. It may manifest as celiac disease, but that's nowhere near the most common manifestation. Mm -hmm. Talk about the link between gluten consumption and the thyroid. What we know is that if you have a sensitivity, if you have celiac disease, 30.3%, that's what the studies say, 30.3% of the people with gluten sensitivity manifesting as celiac disease will have thyroid dysfunction and some thyroid illness of one type or another. Hmm. It may be hyperthyroid or hypothyroid, uh, but there will be some thyroid manifestation, 30%. And uh, it may be the only manifestation, the only symptoms you have are thyroid symptoms. You don't have gut pain or gut dysfunction, which doctors would look for for celiac disease. So that's 30%. We also know that 43% of people um, that have gluten sensitivity will manifest some type of thyroid dysfunction. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know yet if it's one disease, one thyroid disease more than another thyroid disease, but at this point we know it's thyroid dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And that's from the European Journal of Endocrinology, 43% uh, of gluten sensitive patients. So we know that if you have a gluten sensitivity, it's a very common manifestation that it impacts on your thyroid. You mentioned the many different manifestations of thyroid dysfunction. Talk about the one that I've heard about a lot, um, autoimmunity. Oh yes, yes, yeah, very common, very common. And with gluten sensitivity, it's very common. Um, autoimmunity means your immune system's attacking yourself. Uh, and the best way to understand that is vaccinations. We get a shot um, of measles, a, a vaccination for measles. They give you a shot of the bug measles. And your brain says, whoa, what's this? This is not good for me. And your brain says, you, general, and in your immune system, you've got Army, Air Force, Marine Corps generals sitting around with nothing to do. You, general, you now are general measles. Take care of this. General measles builds an assembly line. The assembly line starts producing soldiers trained to go after measles. Those soldiers are called antibodies. So those soldiers are going through the bloodstream looking for measles bugs. You know, and your bloodstream is a highway. Everything's going the same direction, but it's just a highway. Everything's bouncing into each other. Uh, uh, but you've got these antibodies. Think of Arnold Schwarzenegger, his head out of a Humvee with these big dark glasses on, big submachine and over there, over there, <laughs> right? And he's firing these chemical bullets going after measles. Right. When all the measles bugs are gone, general measles turns off the assembly line. There's no more measles antibodies being produced. You don't need them right now. But general measles is vigilant the rest of his life. If, meas if you're ever exposed to measles, he just has to flip the switch. He doesn't have to build the assembly line again. Right. That's why if you go to Africa to visit, you need vaccinations months ahead of time for dengue fever, yellow fever, all these crazy diseases. If you go back 10 years later, you just need a booster shot two weeks before you go just to wake up the general yellow fever and general dengue fever and get those antibodies in there to protect you again, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens with gluten is that Arnold uh, uh, built, there's an assembly line built for gluten because the immune system says this is a problem. For some people, it's a problem. So Arnold is going out there looking for gluten. And gluten is a big molecule. I'm just going to say A, A, B, C, D. Uh, but it's 33 amino acids long. Let's just say A, A, B, C, D. Arnold's looking for A, A, B, C, D everywhere. Over there, firing these chemical bullets. He's going through the bloodstream, bouncing all over the place, looking for it. Now, the surface of your thyroid is made up of proteins and fats. 
The proteins are made up of many amino acids, which includes A, A, B, C, D as part of that big long chain of amino acids. So Arnold, you know, we call here in California, we call him the governator, right? Mm -hmm. So he's, he's got these dark glasses on. He's just looking for gluten, but there's A, A, B, C, D. And he fires his chemical bullets to go after A, A, B, C, D, which happens to be the surface of your thyroid. Mm. So that antibody dis damages or destroys the thyroid cell. Now your body has to make thyroid antibodies to get rid of that cell. Because we always make a little bit of antibody, clean up dead cells and old cells to make room for new cells. That's normal. That's why it's normal to have a few thyroid antibodies. That's why it's normal to have a few brain antibodies. It's because your body is cleaning up the mess. It's when they get elevated and too many, you got a problem. So Arnold is going after gluten and sees the thyroid, A, A, B, C, D. You have toast for breakfast. You make the antibodies to gluten. You have pasta for, or sandwich for lunch. Antibodies to gluten, pasta for dinner, antibodies to gluten, uh, croutons on your salad, antibodies to gluten, a cookie, a sandwich, you know, day in, day out, day in, day out. If you have the sensitivity to gluten, it's the most common food people eat, then you make a lot of antibodies to gluten. Mm -hmm. Then you've got all these Arnolds out there just firing chemical bullets, which may go after A, A, B, C, D on your thyroid. And eventually what happens is you develop the mechanism, you start making antibodies to your thyroid ongoing. And that's why some celiac patients, some gluten sensitive patients, when you get them off of gluten, the thyroid antibodies go down. Hmm. So the Hashimoto's antibodies go down. And we've seen it happen many, many, many times. And there's some well-published papers on that mechanism that you can reduce the antibodies to your thyroid sometimes just by getting rid of the irritating foods that you might be eating. So it sounds like a bad case of mistaken identity. Perfect. That, that actually would be a great title for a book. Hmm. There you go. You can have it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right on. So, so talk about, because gluten, first of all, before we get into the gut part of things, first, I feel like we should maybe paint a better picture for the audience as to which foods contain gluten. So you have like a, a short list? You bet. Uh, any foods that are made with wheat, so that would be breads and cookies and crackers and pasta and pizza. Um, sauces, they often put wheat flour in the sauce to thicken it up a bit. Um, it's wheat, rye, and bar barley. By the way, gluten's not bad for you. Bad gluten is bad for you. What does that mean? There's gluten in rice. There's gluten in corn. They're not in the same toxic family of glutens as the gluten of wheat, rye, and barley. Mm -hmm. Those are the bad guys. Uh, now, someone may be sensitive to corn. Someone may be sensitive to rice. You may be. You may be sensitive to artichokes. You know, we can be sensitive to anything. But in terms of the toxic proteins of gluten, we really should be um, being specific in our language, but we don't. We say gluten. Well, it's not gluten. It's the toxic glutens, and that's wheat, rye, and barley. Mm -hmm. So breads, pastas, pizza, uh, most sauces, soy sauce, because you read on the label, it's got wheat in it. Now, the soy sauce doesn't need wheat, and there are soy sauces that don't have wheat, mm -hmm. but the wheat may be in there. Cosmetics have wheat as filler. Shampoos do. And the shampoo doesn't go through your skin, but you breathe it. So it can activate an immune response because of that. Um, it's, it's the most common food we're exposed to is wheat-derived foods. Well, I'm sure there's someone in our audience who's thinking, oh, I got tested for celiac. You know, my doctor tested me, so I'm fine. Are they fine? No, they're not. The oh, no, no, okay. absolutely not. Really good question. And that's what the entire Gluten Summit was about, is that the tests for celiac disease are very, very accurate right on the money if you have the end stage of celiac disease. If you have an earlier stage in terms of the amount of damage that's been done, the test can be wrong seven out of 10 times saying there's no problem when there really is a problem. So unfortunately, doctors don't know that because the test, the, the, the research to validate that the tests were good, all used celiac patients. But to qualify as a celiac patient, you have to have the end stage of the disease. Mm -hmm. So that's the only blood they checked for the test to see if the test was accurate was people who were at the end stage of the disease and it's right on the money most of the time. Does it work the same way for autoimmune thyroid issues? Is it the same way where they, they wait till it's end stage? And if not, how can you find out before all that bad stuff happens? If you oh, that's the whole, question. that's a really good question. That's the whole world of predictive autoimmunity mm -hmm. and identifying what is your body attacking right now? What aspect of your immune system is your body attacking? 
Now that sounds kind of airy-fairy and why would I want to know? But we've known forever that autoimmune disease is the number three cause of getting sick and dying. And, you know, they're compartmentalized with different specialists, but it's the number three cause. And there are many papers now saying, no, it's actually number one because atherosclerosis is an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So whether you think of it as number one or number three, that means one out of every three people minimum um, at some point are going to have an autoimmune condition. So if you can identify it earlier, see, nobody gets Alzheimer's in their 60s or 70s. You get Alzheimer's in your 20s or 30s. It just takes 30 or 40 years of killing off your brain cells before the damage is noticeable. Actually, it's noticeable earlier, and we joke that we're getting order, older because we don't remember anymore, right? Oh, I'm getting old. I don't remember the way I used to. Ha <laughs> ha. How old are you? Well, I'm 34. No, no. So the, um, the mechanism is going on, and if you can identify the mechanism, of, is my immune system attacking my brain? Is my immune system attacking my thyroid? Is my immune system attacking my muscles? Is my immune system attacking my bones early? Then it gives you a window of opportunity to, you know, heads up, you better like, talk to some doctors that know about this and what can you do to change the direction your body's going in. Mm -hmm. That's the world of predictive autoimmunity. Mm -hmm. That was a primary emphasis of my gluten summit mm -hmm. was it's not gluten, it's that gluten is a common trigger to the autoimmune process. And that's a test offered by? Cyrex Labs Cyrex offers Labs. that you, test. You took the test and you found some antibodies to your brain, wasn't it? I did. Oh, you have good memory. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, so, so what did you do about that? I had three antibody, three different brain tissues that my body was making elevated levels of antibodies to. Myelin basic protein that causes MS, cerebellar peptides that causes a, a degeneration of the cerebellum, and that's part of the brain that controls movement. So when you're an old elder, you can't keep your balance easily. You're a little guarded about walking downstairs and stuff, and then. Uh, gangliosides, which causes numbness and tingling. So I said, this is a mistake. And they said, no, it's not. I said, do it again. They said, we did. We know it's you. We did it again. It's accurate. So that startled me. And I then learned about this whole world and have been working extensively on this ever since. Mm -hmm. Have you gone back for retesting? To see I have. I, they're gone now. Very good, very good. And yeah. so people can take that test to see if there's antibodies to their thyroid, but is there a blood test as well for that? There is, there is. That's a blood test. The blood test, uh, any doctor can do a blood test for thyroid antibodies. Mm -hmm. Any doctor can do a blood test for predictive autoimmunity. The predictive autoimmunity test it looks at 24 different tissue uh, antibodies. It uh, looks at two for your thyroid, six for your brain, mm -hmm. uh, three for your heart, your bones, your muscles, your reproductive system. Gotcha. So it's very comprehensive. Yeah, we talk all about the TGB and TPO and TSI right. antibody tests. So stay tuned for the thyroid sessions. Lots of Absolutely. great information on that. Tell us about the gut impact. I mean, I know gluten really breaks down the gut, causes intestinal permeability and whatnot, and that has influence on that autoimmune thing that you talked about. So go into that. It does. It's actually cutting edge research that's been coming out. The primary um, messenger, if you will, in the scientific community has been Dr. Alessio Fasano, who is the chair of pediatric gastroenterology uh, at uh, Mass General Hospital at Harvard. And uh, we think he'll get the Nobel Prize someday for this. This is just ground changing research that he began publishing in, in the year 2000. So it's been 14 years now that these papers have been coming out. And what he shows is that there's a trilogy in the development of autoimmune diseases, which may be thyroid, it's actually the second most common is thyroid, uh, but there's a trilogy in the development of them. Three things that are required. One, the genetic vulnerability to that particular um, autoimmune condition. Two, an environmental trigger that sets it off, like the straw that broke the camel's back. And the food we eat is environmental triggers. And three, intestinal permeability, or the slang term is leaky gut. Mm -hmm. So those three things are um, uh, present in the development of autoimmune conditions. So, and the papers say this, this is their language, you can arrest the development of autoimmune diseases, which includes thyroid autoimmune disease. You can arrest the development of autoimmune disease by healing the gut. Hmm. That's why it's so critically important to evaluate the intestines when you're considering, do I have a thyroid problem or not? Because you don't necessarily treat where the symptoms are, you are concerned about the symptoms, but you treat what's triggering the symptoms. Mm -hmm. how, how do you do that though? Because there's, there's a lot of people out there who have leaky gut who don't have symptoms in their intestines. That's exactly right. The vast majority of them do not have any symptoms, but you need to do a test. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the test is, once again, from Cyrex Labs, it's the most sensitive test, and it's their array number two mm -hmm. that looks for antibodies that are destroying the intestinal integrity. Mm -hmm. Intestinal permeability, exactly in layman's term, terms, what does that even mean? Good. Your intestines are a tube, 20 to 25 feet long. Think of a donut. If you could just stretch out one long donut and you look down that, that hole, that one long tube. When you eat food, it's still really outside your body. It can't get into the bloodstream to get to your brain or anything. It's got to go through the donut. Mm -hmm. Well, the inside of the donut is lined with shag carpeting. This shag is where calcium's absorbed. This shag, magnesium. These shags, good fats, good proteins. All the shags absorb different nutrients. The shags are covered with a cheesecloth so that only really small nutrients can get through. And the digestive juices in the tube have to be breaking it down smaller and smaller and smaller until it's small enough to go right through the cheesecloth into the shags and then into the bloodstream. Intestinal permeability is when you get tears in the cheesecloth. And just like grandma's cheesecloth for the gravy, you know, you pour the gravy in the cheesecloth, you get the clumps coming through if you've got torn cheesecloth. You get these clumps of food getting into the bloodstream before they should and they're called macromolecules, big molecules. Mm -hmm. And the immune system says, whoa, what's this? This is not good for me, I better fight this. And you get general tomato, if it's a clump of tomato, or general beef, or general chicken. Mm -hmm. And these are the people that do tests and they find out they're allergic to 10, 15 different foods. It's because right. they've got tears in the cheesecloth. And when you heal the cheesecloth in six months to a year, you te do those tests again, you're not allergic to 10 or 15 different foods anymore. Maybe one, maybe two, mm -hmm. but not 10 or 15. And when you've got big pieces of gluten coming into the bloodstream, you've really got a problem. Oh, you've got a huge problem, you mm -hmm. bet. So you said it could be general tomato, general gluten, general chicken, can it be any food? Any food, any macro molecule, any big molecule that gets through the tears in the cheesecloth, your immune system is gonna do exactly what it's supposed to do to try and protect you. It's not an immune system that's gone crazy. And unfortunately, some doctors have told patients, well, we need to suppress your immune system mm. because they've got 25 different foods they're sensitive to. And these people are usually pretty sick. We call them the walking wounded, you know, because they're almost everything they eat or many things they eat give them problems. And your immune system's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. This is a macro molecule. You can't use that as a fuel to build new muscle cells or new brain hormones. So the body's saying, get rid of this thing. It's normal. It's, a, um, it's not normal to have it, but it's a normal response of the immune system to do that. How do you feel about food sensitivity testing? Great, great concept. We've got to test. Now, here's the problem. Um, whether it's pinpricks, and that's an IgE test, true allergies, mm -hmm. or if it's a blood test looking at 90 different foods, that's an IgG test. There are different families of um, how your immune system responds. They're called immunoglobulins, IGs. Your immune system is like the armed forces in your body. There's an army, an air force, a marines, a coast guard, a navy, IgG, IgA, IgE, IgM. There's different branches of the armed forces. When you do a 90 food panel, you're doing IgG. It's a really good test, uh, if it's a good lab. So it can be the Navy, but not the Marines. Exactly. Gotcha. You know, so the Navy comes back normal, and it may be the Marines that are fighting. It may be IgA. And the IgG comes back normal. Your doctor says, oh, you're fine. You may be, you may not be, because it might be the Air Force or the Marines that have been so, called So how out. does somebody find out? How does somebody test for all the different armed forces? Unfortunately, there's no comprehensive test that looks at all of it right now. We need one. We do, yeah. we do. Um, this is revolutionary thinking that labs have, you know, we do IgG, it's very accurate. Well, it's very accurate if you have an IgG reaction, you know, but. Mm -hmm. So um, Cyrex Labs does IgG, IgA, and IgM. Mm -hmm. So that's the best that I've ever seen that's out there. And I have no financial interest in Cyrex whatsoever. It's just the best test that's out there. Right, right now. array what? That's array four okay. that looks at 24 different foods mm -hmm. to see if you're having a reaction to them. Cyrexlabs.com? Cyrexlabs.com. So if someone in the audience can't afford the blood test, if they're not in the budget, what can they do? You'll never harm yourself by trying this. Take out a few foods from your diet for a couple of weeks to a month. Uh, you know, somewhere between three weeks to a month is safe. Just take these foods out of there. Eat nutrient-dense foods, that means like healthy food, but just avoid uh, wheat, uh, dairy, sugar, and soy. From a thyroid perspective, if you avoid those four foods for a month completely, don't cheat 
and have a little bit. You've got to do it completely or else you can't fool the body. But if you avoid those foods and just eat lots of really healthy, you know, vegetables, lots of vegetables, some quality meats, a little bit of rice, a little bit of uh, uh, quinoa or amaranth, if people know that, what those things are, but a little bit of rice. You can have rice every day, it's fine for a little bit. And just avoid those foods and just see how you feel. If you notice all of a sudden, whoa, I'm sleeping better, or I've got a little more juice, I've got a little more energy, or uh, why well, I, I haven't been cold in a while, or my gosh, have I lost a few, my pants are getting a little big on me. Yeah. And I'm not exaggerating, it happens to most people mm -hmm. when they avoid those four foods. Yeah, when I was a practitioner, I would see it all the time. I yeah. take those foods out. It's funny though, when they accidentally, or maybe even on purpose, add those foods back in, they feel terrible. Oh, I love it when a patient comes in and they says, oh doc, we had pizza the other night. I felt, I felt sick as a dog. I said, oh great, I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> no one can argue with you now. Now you know, your body's talking to you. <laughs> now you know. Right. Let's stick with this topic of, of testing, but I want to move to the hormones testing uh, someone who has all these symptoms that you talked about you yeah. know they're the model for hypothyroid or maybe even hyperthyroid they go to the doctor to get tested they do all the tests uh, TSH T4 T3 maybe um, and maybe the antibody test as well but the test markers come back normal what do you think is going on there there is a condition called euthyroid EU thyroid euthyroid and that's when all the blood markers look pretty good, but they've got the symptoms really common and very few practitioners know about this, that there's a toxicity condition that's going on most of the time for those people and it's called lipopolysaccharides, LPS. And that is causing the, that's contributing to and often causing the dysfunction of the thyroid. Because you got normal hormone levels, but it's not getting into the cell, or it's even getting into the cell, but there's an emergency brake. You're trying to drive down the street, but the emergency brake's on. Mm -hmm. And that can be LPS, or lipopolysaccharide toxicity. Explain LPS. You and I did a show on this a couple of years ago. Um, bacteria in the gut producing toxins. They slip right. through the bloodstream. Go ahead. Right. Uh, you know, and this is a little weird, maybe, for people who haven't heard this before, but we're exposed to bacteria all day, every day. You know, uh, there's no way to avoid it. Uh, the water we drink, the food we eat, you open the door to your house and your hands full of bacteria and then you grab a, uh, an apple and you eat an apple, you get the bacteria. So we're exposed to things all day every day. Most of it's okay, most of it's not bad for us, but some of it is, but it's in small enough portions that it's not a problem. And some of that bad stuff is called gram-negative bacteria. Once again, there's no way to avoid it. We all get exposure to it every day. But the immune system in your gut, you know, 70% of the immune system's in your gut. It's, it's not in your bloodstream. 70% of everything to protect you from colds, flus, viruses, bacteria, cancer, it's in your gut. That's because we're exposed to most, mo most of the dangerous things we're exposed to come through the gut. Mm -hmm. So this LPS is the exhaust of gram-negative bacteria that we're exposed to every day. You can't ignore it. But if you've got a tear in your cheesecloth, for example, intestinal permeability, these macromolecules of LPS get through into the bloodstream, and one of the symptoms that it may manifest is euthyroid dysfunction. So you've got all the symptoms of hypothyroid, and yet your blood tests are normal. Hmm. Healing the gut. I'm sure you want to remove the things that are causing damage to the gut. So what are some of those? Uh, first, you have to look for the environmental triggers that are setting it off. So you identify, is it gluten, is it dairy, or are there other foods I'm sensitive to? Um, uh, and then in healing, there's lots of different pieces of nutrition that can be used. I think there are six that are foundational that should always be included. But there are many, many good things out there. I can't say enough about how many great things there are that help contribute to healing the gut. You want to turn on the genes as many ways as you can. It's called a pleiotropic approach. That's a really good Scrabble word, by the way. <laughs> pleiotropic. P-L-E-I-O-T-R-O-P-I-C. Pleiotropic. It's kind of it's actually more than seven letters, though, so you can't use it with Scrabble. <laughs> right. But, sorry. But <laughs> so, um, you want to turn on the genes to heal the gut. Calm down the inflammation. Turn, um, um, uh, rebuild healthier tissue. Um, heal the tears in the permeability. And those are glutamine. That's an amino acid. Fish oils, the good fats from fish oils, vitamin D, colostrum, um, uh, probiotics, and there's one other I'm forgetting. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. It's on my website. You can find it there. Mm -hmm. but. Gotcha. The causes, um, so gluten, poor foods, poor diet, stress can right. cause 
permeability of the gut. Right. Um, medications, I've heard as well. Oh, that's true. What do you have to say about medications when it comes to thyroid? The FDA came out in 2009 and warned that there are some thyroid medications that may cause serious consequences, including, including liver dysfunction, liver disease, and death. Hmm. So uh, and that's not common at all, but it can happen. So you just want to notice that if you're taking the medications for thyroid, and by all means take your medications, don't ever stop without the support of your practitioner. But you, if you're taking medications and you're not feeling better, you're not feeling substantially better, you might want to reevaluate from a more comprehensive overview with some of the things we're talking about here today. Yeah, I learned some crazy stuff about medications for, from Dr. Austin. There's actually uh, thyroid drugs that are, or, yeah, thyroid drugs that have gluten in them. Yes. And lactose and all this other crazy stuff. I learned from uh, Dr. Cohen, or Susie Cohen, I should say, America's pharmacist. Yes. Uh, she was talking about how uh, particular medications block nutrients. They can actually cause nutrient deficiencies, and these nutrients are really important for That's right. thyroid health. I uh, learned a lot of great stuff. You guys yes. certainly have to tune in. Dr. O'Brien, I'm getting to, to the end of my questions for you. Do you have any other, like, truth bombs you want to share with the audience about thyroid? Thyroid function is critical to your well-being. All of our organs are critical. You know, there's no spare parts, right? But thyroid function is so critical to your sense of well-being, feeling great. So whatever it takes, you know, to, in terms of making sure your thyroid's functioning really well, and what you'll learn in this summit, there are so many different aspects of what might cause a problem. It's like a person takes their car to the mechanic and says, my car's not running well, and then they leave. Well, it might be you're out of tune, you might be low on oil, it might be the transmission's gone bad. You know, there's so many things that could happen. That's why this summit is so important because people can get overwhelmed by the amount of information, but that's why you listen to it again and again and until you get the um, area that say, you know what, I think I'm gonna check that out. I'm gonna see, and you just keep exploring. You keep looking until you find, you know what, I'm feeling better now. I noticed that I'm feeling better than I was three or four months ago. These things don't turn around in a day, but as you explore the information that you're getting on this summit, you'll find the things that are gonna help you. Yeah, yeah, the gluten summit. Just, just crushed it last year, fantastic event. Tell our audience about that. Oh, thank you, theglutensummit.com. Um, I interviewed 29 of the world's leaders on gluten sensitivity and celiac disease, and I went to England and spoke to the godfather of it all, and uh, the, the chair of Celiac Society of Italy, and the godfather of predictive autoimmunity in Tel Aviv, Israel, and, and I interviewed these people and I, you know, I said to them, Sean, you know, uh, Professor, I may interrupt you during the interview. If I do, please excuse me. And then they, what? I said, well, because if you say something that I understand, but the audience doesn't, they start thinking about dinner, yeah. right? And so I said, oh, okay. And I did. I interrupted them frequently. And so, so does that mean, and would that suggest, and they go, yes, yeah, okay, oh, do you hear this? So I did that with all of the interviews, and um, Sean, you were a guest, and, and the, um, uh, there were seven nutritionists that were there. Uh, and the result was people who listened to the Gluten Summit, they now know about gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. And they know how to find out if it's a problem for them and how it may manifest outside the gut with their brain or their thyroid or their liver or their muscles or their bones. Uh, uh, it was a fantastic event, and I'm so grateful for all the support we've gotten. Yeah, it was great. Your website is thedoctor.com. The, the dr.com. Yes. I love that website, the dr.com. And it's thegluten.summit.com as well, right? Yes. Oh, man, thanks so much. Thank you, Sean.